Today we're going to start another book. The name of the book is A People and Their Quilts, and it was written by John Rice Irwin. You may remember if you follow along with all the books, another book that we read by John, and it was Alex Stewart. So I'll leave that link for that playlist of, of readings down below in case you missed that. It's a really, really interesting book. Now this one's really interesting because it talks about the history of the of quilting and especially the important role it played in the southern mountains of Appalachia, but it also shares some stories from the people, from the, all the different people that John talked to about the, the wonderful quilt and that tradition of quilting. I'd heard about this book, but I had never read it until a dear sweet lady named Amy sent it to me. She wanted me to have it. So I'm very thankful that she did because I wasn't aware of it. And it's a really good book that I hope you enjoy. We'll start here at the beginning. I'll read you his introduction first. Few items in our culture have been so necessary, colorful, artistic, cherished, cared for, and universally used as the quilt. In over a quarter century of collecting relics throughout the southern Appalachian Mountains for the Museum of Appalachia in Norris, Tennessee, I've had occasion to go through literally thousands of homes, from the smallest one-room mountain cabin to the palatial antebellum homes along the riverways. I recall only a single instance where the chattels of a household did not include quilts. The quilt, perhaps as much as any household item, tended to be made by the family which used it. Probably no craft or art form was more widely practiced by women in all stations of life than quilting, not only in this country, but in the lands from whence the early settlers came, from Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, to maidens in the most impoverished European cottages, and in America from wives of presidents to women living in one room, dirt floored frontier cabins, the needles flew and beautiful as well as useful quilts were made. Several books have been written on the subject of quilts in America, usually emphasizing the inestimable variety of patterns, the artistic qualities, and the intricate and detailed stitching. Many of these works place heavy emphasis upon the technical aspects of special patterns, and several are how-to books. The area which seems to have been neglected is that which deals with quilts in direct relation to people. Coincidentally, this is an area where my greatest interest lies. Hence, this book deals with quilts as they relate to the people who made, used, and enjoyed them. Emphasis is placed on quilts and quilters in the states located within the southern Appalachian region, with comparisons and contrast to quilts and quilters in various parts of America and other countries which influenced our quilt-making culture. It would be wonderful if we could view the old-time quilt makers as they plied their craft and attended quilting bees so that we could learn firsthand the lore of one of our country's most prevalent and most beloved art and craft forms. But this scene has largely passed in most areas except for the revivalist, the younger folk who have taken up their grandmother's ways. One of the areas in America where old-time quilting never altogether ceased was southern Appalachia. This is a suitable area to study the American quilt because the region was settled by diversified groups, including the Pennsylvania Dutch, the Welsh, the English, the Scot-Irish, the Blacks, and the French Huguenots, and because those who immigrated from this region after a generation or two helped to populate a large part of the United States, the Midwest first, then Texas, the Far West, and the Northwest. Therefore, kinship exists between the Southern Appalachian region and other parts of the country. With few exceptions, each type of quilt found in the rest of the country may be found in this area. Because of economic and geographic conditions in the region, quilting flourished longer here than anywhere else. In fact, it never really ceased being popular among the women of this area. While store-bought blankets became popular in other sections of the country, the quilt remained the mainstay in Appalachia. When the quilt revival began sweeping the country, the art craft had to be resurrected in most areas, but it had never died here. This region provides a glimpse into a lifestyle related to quilts that no longer exist in more urbanized, industrialized, and less isolated regions. A look at these folk may provide a semblance of what quilters and quilting were like throughout the country in the early days. 
The photographs, interviews, and conversations included in the following chapters are provided as steps for more serious and competent researchers who may follow. The quilt comes to America. Quilt pattern names frequently relate to pioneer times, historic events, political figures, or foreign countries. The pattern names do not often relate to household items or to women themselves. These two quilts are exceptions. The cake stand quilt at left was purchased at public auction from the McLeod Estate Sale at Halls Crossroads, Knox County, Tennessee. The McLeods reportedly settled there soon after the American Revolution. The road on which the home place was located is named Tom McLeod Road after the man of that name who was known as Buttermilk Tom because he peddled buttermilk in the nearby city of Knoxville. The quilt is pieced and has intricate stitching. The contrary wife quilt on the right is also from Knox County, Tennessee. It has a wide blue border set back from the edge and the colors are patriotic, red, white, and blue. Grandfather Irwin often told the story of a poor young lad named Calloway McGee who would come to his father's home in the dead of winter, barefoot and coatless, to get some corn or a few potatoes for his destitute family. I've seen him many a time come hopping through the snow with no shoes on and him about froze to death. There was 14 children in our family and we had to be mighty saving, Grandpa said, but Mama would always give that poor boy something to eat and sometimes an old coat. Well, in a few days he'd be back and he wouldn't have his coat on. Mama would say, Callaway, what happened to your coat? And he'd say, Mama cut it up to make a quilt. Grandpa would chuckle at the recollection of poor Calloway, and then he'd repeat his answer, Mama cut it up to make a quilt. This is illustrative of the importance attached to the quilt in frontier-type conditions in this country. That a mother would use her son's only coat to make a quilt is undisputed proof of the value placed on having adequate bed covers. In 1962, as superintendent of schools in Anderson County, Tennessee, I visited a home in a remote section of the Cumberland Mountains to determine why none of the 13 children were attending school. My attendance teacher told me that many children were missing school because of a lack of clothing, and I wanted a first-hand look. The house consisted of only two ordinary sized rooms, and both were all but void of furniture. One room served as a kitchen, but it had only a tiny laundry type stove, a small table, a crude plank bench, and two or three chairs. The other room had two beds, a threadbare couch, and no heat. There was, of course, no inside plumbing, and I never knew how far they had to carry their water. The house was dark, lighted only by one curtainless window. At first, I didn't notice the contents of the big bed in the corner of the room, but as my eyes adjusted to the dim light, there slowly appeared the forms of six small bodies in the bed with only their heads peering from the heavy quilts. They were wide awake, perfectly still, and deathly quiet. My assumption that they were sick was quickly dispelled when their mother told me that they were in bed to keep warm. We ain't got no heat, and none of them have enough clothes to keep them warm, so it's just keep them in the bed or let them freeze. If it wasn't for the bed kivers, I guess we'd all freeze. I never passed that little shotgun cabin hanging on the side of a steep bank without thinking of those children lying there in the late afternoon, peering wide-eyed and silent from under the big patchwork quilt, and the quilt was the only colorful object in the otherwise drab and austere little house. Twenty years later, in 1982, several of these same children visited me, and I was amazed at how healthy and prosperous they appeared to be. One was a postal employee in Birmingham, one was a school teacher in Ohio, and all the others had respectable jobs and seemed to be well-adjusted, middle-class citizens. The process of quilting in the most general sense is the joining together of two pieces of material and a central filling by stitching the three layers together. Although the stitching originated for the practical purpose of holding the filling in place, the intricacy and minuteness of this stitching soon became as much aesthetic as utilitarian. 
The word quilt is from Latin, believed to have come from the word calceta, which means stuffed sock, mattress, or cushion. While the above definition is generally accepted, it is not broad enough to embrace all items we refer to as quilts. For example, the top and back are sometimes quilted or sewn together without a padding, and this is called a quilt. Sometimes two pieces of material and the stuffing are secured together by tacking or tying, a process discussed in connection with comforters in another chapter, and this too is called a quilt. Although we generally refer to these two types as quilts, neither of them fits the definition as given. In many parts of rural America, bed covers or bed kivers have been synonymous with quilts, but quilted material for clothing and even carpets seem to have been the oldest and most popular form. Documentation of quilted clothing goes back as far as 3000 BC. The art craft of quilting was practiced by the ancient Chinese, Egyptians, Greeks, and by virtually all civilizations as cloth was developed. It has been documented that many warriors who participated in the Crusades starting in the 12th century used quilted padding beneath their armor. Some suggest that these Crusaders who marched from the Western European countries to crush Muslims in the Holy Land first became acquainted with quilted material in the Middle East and carried it back to their households. Great catastrophes sometimes have beneficial byproducts, and the popularization of the quilt is said to have been largely brought about by such a calamity. In Europe in the 14th century, severely cold weather, which came to be known as the Great Freeze, lasted for a number of winters and caused the major rivers such as the Thames, the Rhine, and the Rhone to freeze solidly. Partly for necessity and partly to relieve themselves from the boredom resulting from prolonged confinement, women busied themselves with making quilted material for garments and bed coverings. The first quilts may have been purely for utilitarian use, but it wasn't long before decorative and artistic qualities were added. The French are largely credited with introducing floral applique, Quilting in Italy was centered mainly in Sicily and stressed aesthetics rather than warmth and comfort. Quilting in England became widespread as early as the 15th century. In the British Isles and Low Countries, quilting became a cottage industry where women made quilts for their own use and to sell or trade for other commodities. Prior to the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, cloth was heavy, homespun, and homewoven. This hand-woven cloth continued to be used for making quilts in America in isolated areas for another hundred years. Elizabeth Smith Scable, in an article published in the Tennessee Folklore Society Bulletin, 1981, writes that there are no records to indicate that early colonists brought quilts with them to America. She found no reference to quilts in America until the latter part of the 17th century, a half century after the first settlers arrived. Other students of the subject feel quilts were surely among the possessions brought to the New World by the early colonists, but that they failed to survive because of the limited life of textiles generally and because of their continuous use. Patsy and Myron Orlofusky, in their well-researched and documented book, Quilts in America, make reference to a calico quilt. Colored and flowered, listed in the inventory of Captain George Corwin, who died in Salem, Massachusetts in 1685. They also note that a list of Captain John Kidd's chattels, when he and his wife Sarah started housekeeping in New York in 1692, included feather beds, feather pillows, tablecloths, linen sheets, napkins, tin blankets, and three quilts. This is the same Captain Kidd who later gained infamy as a pirate. There is little doubt that quilts have been an integral part of American households since the country's earliest days. America is credited with the development of the rifle gun, the Kentucky rifle, which revolutionized weaponry, but the rifling of gun barrels had been experimented with in Germany long before. The dulcimer is called an American instrument, yet its ancestors were developed in mainland Europe. Likewise, the patchwork quilt is said by many to be an American innovation, yet is developed from antecedent in the old countries. 
just as the rifle and the dulcimer have antecedents in Europe, the Kentucky rifle and the mountain dulcimer have distinctly American forms, as does the patchwork quilt. The patchwork and other types are discussed more thoroughly in another chapter. Quilting bees or quilting parties, even more than patchwork quilts, are sometimes considered an American innovation. Frontier conditions necessitated almost constant work, leaving little time for pleasure. Strict religious beliefs often discourage social or recreational gatherings, but quilting bees, while often characterized as joyful occasions, could be justified because they were ostensibly for the purposes of accomplishment, at least enough so to satisfy the Protestant work ethic. Amanda McDowell, as a young lady writing in her diary in 1863 in White County, Tennessee, raised this interesting question. Should she join in a quilting held on Christmas Day? The question is especially meaningful when one considers that this was in the midst of the Civil War and that most of the boys her age, including some of her brothers, were fighting and dying on both sides of the struggle. Her answer seems to be that she personally saw nothing wrong with such an event, but that she would not sponsor it because of what others would think and say. The diary entry is as follows. December 24th, 1863. Christmas Eve. I've been baking some just for old custom's sake, for I do not look for anyone, but perhaps Fayette will come in a few days, though I hear they are gone to Kentucky. I feel lonely, but that is nothing uncommon. If there is any gaiety about, I do not know where it is. Though I hear of a quilting tomorrow, I would not make a quilting on that day, Christmas. But if I wanted one, would make it sometime during the holidays. But it seems a little like profanation. Though I suppose it is no harm to be joyful on that day. But how many are there who think of the thing that ought to cause it to be a day of rejoicing and thanksgiving? If the women weren't allowed by husbands or fathers or their own conscience to participate in social gatherings as such, they could hardly be scolded for getting together for such a necessary and worthwhile purpose as quilting. It is not clear how often social events such as quilting bees occurred. There seems to be no doubt that numerous chores in frontier society were accomplished at least on occasion by workings or group participation. Historian Dr. J. G. M. Ramsey lived during the frontier period and alluded to the quilting bee as an integral part of the social life of that period. He wrote, a failure to ask a neighbor to a raising, a clearing, a chopping frolic, or his family to a quilting was considered a high indignity such as one too, as required to be explained or atoned for at the next muster or county court. Each settler was not only willing, but desirous to contribute his share to the general comfort and public improvement, and felt aggrieved and insulted if the opportunity to do so were withheld. Women attending quilting bees and quilting parties, while none of the other household chores warranted such gatherings, baking, making kraut, drying fruit, or butchering animals was not an occasion for such parties. Quilting bees often involved a community endeavor to make a present for one of its members. The church member made quilts for their preacher. Quilts were made for a young lady of the community as a wedding present, and the girls and young women made quilts for the young men of their community. These were sometimes signed by the girls and were known as friendship quilts. Many quilting bees were held to make a quilt for the family in whose home it was set up. Diaries, letters, and other documents report a woman putting up a quilt and then inviting her neighbors. She would put out the word or actually send some member of the family, usually a young boy, around the community to announce the event. One might think this practice would have been viewed as means of soliciting free labor. However, as Ramsey pointed out, indignation most frequently resulted not from being invited to help one's neighbor at such affairs, but from not being invited. A number of women interviewed about quilting bees knew grandmothers whose memories went back as far as the pioneer period. Most of the women never participated in any kind of gathering for the purpose of quilting, except in the 1920s and 1930s when quilting was enjoying a healthy revival. Little evidence exists to indicate that quilting parties were a universal practice in the pioneer frontier era. 
I asked Clemmie Pugh, who was 100 years old at the time, if she attended or knew about quilting parties. She was a girl in the mountains of Overton County, Tennessee in the 1880s and 1890s. No, didn't have nothing in our country like that. Everybody was poor, and we didn't ever have any get-togethers in the country. No way to go any place. Tiny Baker was 92 years of age when she was asked about quilting bees. She was living in rural Knox County, Tennessee, in a log house where she was born. Her father, preacher Tom Baker, and his father, Anderson Baker, were also born in the same house built by the family in the early 1830s. Tiny was most knowledgeable about the past, but she did not recall much about the quilting bee. Oh, I've heard of quilting bees, but none of our folks that I know of ever was involved in such as that. Now, there'd be several women who was members of the family that would get together and quilt, but as far as just getting up and going to a quilting party, I don't remember any of the old folks ever doing that. Jetty Smith does remember what she calls quilting parties when she was a girl growing up in Poorland Valley in the rural East Tennessee County of Union during World War I. Well, somebody would put out the word that they's having a quilting party on a certain night, and several of them neighborhood women would gather in. They'd either walk or ride a mule, but of course most of them lived fairly close. They wouldn't come from too far away. I asked her if the men usually attended. No, just the women. They generally have popcorn, baked sweet potatoes, and molasses candy to eat, and they'd all sit around and quilt till bedtime. Opal Hatmaker, who is discussed extensively in another chapter, grew up in the same period in a coal mining area near Bryceville, some 30 miles west of Knoxville. My questions regarding the quilting bee evoked fond memories for her. Oh yes, I had many a quilting bee. If I wanted to have a quilting, I'd put the word out, usually at the church, that I had a quilt up and that we is having a quilting. There is no doubt that the quilting bee was more common in some sections of the country than in others. Such events may have been more common in the more well-to-do areas and were not as common in the frontier era as we may have been led to believe. Stephen Foster's seeing Nellie home and his allusion to Aunt Dinah's quilting party may have contributed to that exaggerated notion. Most of the early homes consisted of one or two rooms and the families were large. Hence, the lack of space itself would have been a deterrent. The fact that women, as a rule, had several children to care for made it even more difficult. Evidence suggests that most quilts were not made at quilting bees, and the quilting party was not commonplace in all areas and in all eras of American history. Misleading general statements about quilts also have been made regarding geographical origins. For example, that the quilts of the South were more ornate, colorful, and artistic because there was more leisure among the ladies of that era. This may have been true in the homes of a small minority of affluent plantation homes in some sections of some states in the South. However, a statement of this sort is like saying all Japanese make silk. Everybody in West Virginia mines coal or that all Californians are movie stars. If a general statement could be made about the quilters of the South, I should think the opposite would be more likely to be true. Nevertheless, there were many similarities in the developments of quilts in America. Types of quilt patterns and their names are remarkably similar throughout the country. We'll start right there for today. Really interesting first part of the book. He's just trying to explain everything and, um, and get it all started. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me, since I like to talk about Appalachia, am I a quilter? I'm not. I can barely sew on a button. I don't, I don't sew. Uh, but Granny does, and Granny loved to make quilts. She don't make them so much now, but she made them my whole life growing up, and, and much of my life I slept under those quilts, so they've, they've kept me warm. I really like John Rice Irwin's take on the quilts. Like him, I think they're beautiful. I think those big, beautiful, think of the uh, like wedding ring and all the different applique and all the different patterns. I think they're beautiful. They're really lovely and amazing artwork. And, and they would even keep you warm too, you know, but they're just works of art. But I'm much more interested in the ones like he's describing, the stories behind the quilts where the, 
the ladies sit at, you know, at, whether they were at a quilt and bee or they sit at home, at, you know, at night while everybody's together together and they piece their quilts and they quilt. And I'm much more interested in those. And I much like those. I prefer those more utilitarian ones. Now, Granny made some really pretty, pur you know, applique ones. I have a purple one that's uh, purple and white polka dots and then she put the flowers on each of the squares like applique she made that especially for me and it's really pretty but my favorite ones are the ones that she just made out of uh, maybe you know fabric that she had around the house fabric that she got where she worked at the dress factory just utilitarian ones um, one of my favorite ones that granny made that I still have and I can remember it from when I was a little bitty girl and it's coming apart, it's tattered. But if I'm feeling bad, that's the quilt I want just because it's been around and it's like corduroy. It's different colors of red and uh, greens corduroy. I really love it. I have one quilt that my Mama Marie made, Pap's mother. My Aunt Carrie gave it to me years ago and it's more of the utilitarian kind too and I really like it. You know, it is it is more of, um, instead of a patchwork, more of like one color of fabric on one side and one on the back but I love it because she liked to quilt her and her mother and they had little stamps so she stamped her name on one of the corners so I really treasure that I have a few quilts that uh, other people made that have just come into my into my uh, collection over the years um, one from a local lady down the road that her family was just getting rid of stuff and it was in that so I, I got that and you know it's just some people really care for those old kind of things and some people don't and that's okay everybody has their own preferences you know and then uh, last year at Christmas Corey got me one me and her had the opportunity to go to my granny's old house Gazzy's house and she found a old um, quilt top and it was all ratty and dirty and Corey said, do you think it would clean up? I said, probably not, but Corey took it. Of course, I had no clue. She took it and, and washed it, and it did all come clean, and then she had it quilted for me, so that's really a really special one because um, I wasn't even going to take it with me because I just thought it, the mice and things had been in it, and I just figured it was too far gone to actually be able, able to salvage, but they did salvage it. Interesting that he talked about the quilting bees not being maybe they're not as was not as common as what people thought But in maybe in certain other areas, of course, we just got through reading Granny Hyatt and the Nine Brides But that book was set in uh, he talked about the 20s and the 30s It was set more in that time period than in you know uh, Maybe the late 1800s or the early 1900s. So it was set at a different time uh, but interesting that maybe uh, because he mentioned the songs and the different things that maybe we have this perception where people gathered all the time to quilt. I certainly think that they did do that some, but, but he's obviously, you know, the people that he asked said, no, we never done that. We never, never did do anything like that. And as far as Granny in my lifetime, she made, like I said, you know, quilts, uh, lots of many, many quilts, but she made them by herself. She didn't have a party or didn't take them somewhere and, and let other people work on them. She made them by herself. So that's interesting, though, that he brought that out, that maybe it is those, um, thinking of this, the cultural thing of looking back, how that seems so wonderful to all the women to gather together and quilt, that maybe it wasn't as common. And maybe, though, like he said, in certain areas, maybe it was more common. And then probably as time went on, thinking about the 20s and the 30s. But that song that he mentioned about the, um, I've already forgot the name of it now, because I want to I wanna make sure that I, I get it right so I could tell you. Ain't Dinah's Quilting Party. Ain't Dinah's Quilting Party. Years ago, when I first started um, riding on the Blind Pig and the Acorn, one of my friends, who actually is the reason I credit her with letting me learn about blogs, and then that led to me actually starting the Blind Pig and the Acorn. But she was having, she's a quilter, and she was having a, a giveaway, and I think she was giving away a quilt, is what it was. And she wanted to, um, you know, she asked you to, to enter the contest. She wanted you to do something unique or whatever as an entry to win it. And so we were always picking and grinning, you know, picking the guitar and singing down at Paul's. And so I got Paul and Pap thinking about that song, but her name is Dana. So I got them to change Dinah to Dana. And I'll link to that so that you can go back and watch it. Turned out to be a beautiful, you know, recording of Pap and Paul doing the song, but I didn't win the quilt. I didn't get the quilt. Um, of course, she done it randomly. I don't think she, you know, didn't judge like on what you had actually entered, but she did ask you to do something unique to enter the giveaway. And it was a lot of fun for us to do it, so I'll link to that. 
uh, so that you can go and uh, watch Paul and Pap do that song. And they did change the change the name to Be Dana. So I hope you enjoyed this first part of the the book about quilts by. Um, John Rice Irwin at People and Their Quilts is the name of the book. I hope you enjoyed it. He's just laying the groundwork trying to explain all the history of the quilt and stuff and the rest of the book shares more of the wonderful stories from people. Um, it's just so fascinating to think about. I'm, I'm a history buff, a history lover, of course, especially when it's talking about history of my area, but to think about how the people's lives have changed and how in, in those days, you know, really sad talking about those uh, children that the little boy with the coat and then his mother made a quilt out of it and then the kids in, you know, in the bed, but the mother was keeping them warm. She was keeping them warm under the quilt. So um, amazing to think about the... Uh, the quilt and what it means now whether you're calling it a quilt but if you think about kivers covers or blankets or whatever amazing how we all need them and that is a common thing like john's saying throughout history but throughout the world not just you know not just in southern appalachia but across america and even across the world so fascinating to think about it please let leave a comment and let me know what you liked about this first part of the book and i hope you'll drop back by next friday and we'll see what john talks about next